February the 21st, 1990, I took, uh, accompanied a crew from Nippon Television Network uh, to witness the a test flight of an object over Groom Lake, which is known as Area 51. We arrived at the site around just after sundown because according to the information given to us on that same day when we visited Mr. Lazar at his residence, he said that if you go there after sundown and stand near the mailbox area of Highway 375, looking south towards Groom Mountains and also to the Jumble Hills, you will see test flight of these objects. And lo and behold, when we arrived at the scene, exactly around 6.45 or so, we started seeing, and uh, we suddenly started seeing an orangish, yellowish uh, light uh, suddenly appear on top of jumbled hills, making a motion to the right for about uh, 15 seconds or so. Next, exactly at 8.15 p.m., we had another sighting of an, the same object that suddenly appeared on top of jumbled hills, came up above the hills, and uh, uh, made its appearance went slightly to the right side, and at that juncture in time, it made a sudden descension and a back turn, which I estimated to be uh, possibly about 5,000 feet sudden descension, a back turn descension. And I had never seen anything like that in my life ever, and it is definitely a uh, test fight of highly unusual uh, object, a demonstration of technology, a propulsion system so exotic right now that we don't know what it was, but it was being tested at that very night. I said, why at sunset? And he said, well, statistically, uh, up in that area, there's the least traffic around then. So I drove with Bob and uh, the real estate appraiser, Gene Huff, and myself, and we drove up there, got there just a little bit before, before sunset. I took my Celestron telescope, we took a video camera, uh, got out of the uh, car, and within maybe 10 or 15 minutes, this disc comes up from behind the mountains and starts doing all these fantastic maneuvers. Uh, it was a light, a very bright light, and you couldn't see the disc form. But I had my Celestron scope with me, which is uh, eight inches, extremely powerful. And after a few minutes, I was able to get it right in the the uh, finder of the Celestron telescope. And I saw for myself it was a disc. There was no question in my mind. And I just watched it go down behind the mountains. I was traveling in a car with, with my friend down the road, and a very large object flashed over the car and then began to float probably about a mile away from us in the open desert. We got out of the car, ran towards the object, and got within a few hundred yards of a large disc-shaped object about uh, 40 feet in diameter that looked like a, uh, a saucer with a teacup on the top of it. It glowed a brilliant reddish-orange color and then glowed a real bright yellow color. Uh, on one occasion, we thought that the object was actually going to explode because it glowed so brilliantly. It would shoot up to about 200 feet in the air, make a falling leaf motion back and forth, and then go back down onto the ground. Um, this object was uh, was amazing. I was so excited because I'd never seen anything before like this ever in my life. We got our faces burned. We had a mild case of radiation poisoning after that. Uh, we had fevers for three or four days of about 102, 103 degrees which we felt was radiation poisoning. And since then, I've been out the Area 51 area uh, probably some 40, 50 times or so and have take, taken quite literally hundreds of people out there. We saw six craft that night, each one in succession. And it was craft number about two or three that was, was the most dramatic. That is, it was the one that came the closest, and I took a photograph of it. What we actually saw, Michael, was a craft that was ellipsoidal in shape, it was pulsating brightly, and 
While we couldn't see the outline of the craft, the stripped outline, we saw this very brightly pulsating ellipsoid. And when I snapped some shots, apparently the camera, with its low-end optics, that is, we didn't have a huge magnifying lens, so it didn't bring the craft in so close that it would have appeared as a giant blur of light. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> plus, it must have caught the craft in a trough of its pulse because the photograph captured the craft beautifully. That is the outline of it. So it was just a, a fluke of being at the right place at the right time and <laughs> having the right optical setup. What's going on in Area 51 today, uh, based on information from first-person interviews I've made over the last six or seven years, there are at least eight black programs flying out of Groom Lake, out of Area 51. That does not include it does not count the B-2 bomber because it's not a black program. It does not count the F-117, which is a virtually a, a white program today. There are at least two very, very high-speed aircraft that are have been reported for since 1982 is when we've heard the first reports of them. One of them is a small aircraft. It goes approximately Mach 4 to Mach 6. There's an aircraft that has been tracked out of the Bay Area Tracon in Oakland, California by the Federal Aviation administration center oh, at least eight times since 1986 flying in excess of 10,000 miles an hour going through controlled airspace and a very very large aircraft at that besides the two high-speed aircraft there is a stealth or low observable electronic warfare aircraft it's been referred to as Excalibur there is an aircraft that is designed to fly very, very high, but very, very slow and very, very quiet. Uh, there's been some rumblings or reports as a flying triangle, much like the canceled McDonnell Douglas General Dynamics A-12 of, uh, that was going to be an attack aircraft. Just recently, out of Lancaster, California, taken off from Palmdale, which is Air Force Plant 42, and that's where the B-1 was built. The B-2 bomber is being built there. The F-117 is being serviced there in the U-2 operations. There has been at least three sightings of triangular-shaped aircraft being launched out of that area. They made no noise, and just the people just happened to look up and see these things leaving the, uh, the area at relatively low altitude, but again, no noise. Are there any unconventional technologies, propulsion technologies involved? Yes, I have uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity over the years to interview, again, people who have worked at the test site at Groom Lake. Uh, one gentleman spent 12 of his 30 years in black programs at Groom Lake. When I asked him, I said, uh, first of all, I said, do you believe in UFOs? And he looked at me with a straight face in one-on-one -on -one, and he said, absolutely, positively, they do exist. I said, can you expand upon that? And he said, no, I can't. About a year later, we were talking about, again, activities at Groom Lake. And I asked him, I said, you know, can, can, can you really let me tell me what's happening out there? And he said, well, there's a lot of things that are going on there that I won't be able to tell you until, until the year 2025. But we have things in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas envious. Another individual who was a, an NCO, an E-9, uh, which is a, the highest grade you can get as an enlisted man, he's a chief master sergeant in the Air Force, was a safety specialist. He had three different tours of duty at Groom Lake on various programs. Now, he had no connection with my, my, my friend who worked on the other black, other black programs. We were talking, I interviewed him at Nellis in 1985, 86 time frame. And I said, what's out there? And again, he, he, look, he looked me straight in the eye and he says, we have things out there that are literally out of this world. I said, explain. He said, I can't. But trust me, he said, we have things that are, that we, that, that are better than Star Trek, better than, than anything you can see in the movies. He said, are the airplanes? He said, I can't comment. There are four aerospace covert facilities. This is what we call the aerospace connection in the Antelope Valley and also the San Joaquin Valley. Rockwell in the San Joaquin, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, and Northrop in the Antelope Valleys. And these 
operations are extremely suspicious. They have a surface cover activity. They call themselves RCS testing sites. That stands for radar cross-section. And apparently their presumed purpose is to test various aeroform designs atop pylons with radar cross-section. And the disturbing part is that we have found out with incontrovertible proof that there are extensive underground facilities. And for example, Northrop, we have documented to have 42 levels underground. Now, if this is radar cross-section testing, which is above ground, why do they need 42 levels underground? Also, at the Lockheed facility out in Hellendale, we had an investigative reporter who saw a blueprint of the building plans for that facility that he wasn't supposed to see. It showed that they had an extensive underground facility 300 feet down. And when this in reporter interviewed the person who was in charge of that facility, they had a nice, pleasant interview until at the end, he told the director that he was aware of this extensive underground facility. And what could he tell him about that? And immediately, the man's eyes grew wide, and he said, this interview is terminated. So it's very suspicious. <clears throat> And then, of course, we have other reports of people in the area who say that they have seen alien craft emanating from these facilities and terminating at these facilities. Area 51 is, has three tiers of security systems. The outer perimeter security, the inner security, and also the regular military security, plus automated security systems. We're talking about outer perimeter security. Area 51 is using semi-private security firms such as Wackenhut Corporation. We call them Wackenhut SS because basically it's the way they operate. Wackenhut SS, of course, means Wackenhut Special Securities Corporation, of course, and they are assigned to guard the outer perimeters of Area 51. And they, because of the status of being a semi-private status, they don't wear any insignias of any kind. They wear military camouflage uniforms and carry machine guns and so on. They ride unmarked uh, four-wheel blazer type vehicles and they, they harass citizens who even dare to drive on any of these dirt roads south of the Highway 375. We have every right to be driving on these public lands as long as we don't cross the warning sign area. We were harassed by dangerously maneuvering helicopter over public land on May 16, 1991. A group of us, all together, 18 of us, were in a seven-car caravan just coming back on Groom Road after taking pictures of the warning sign area. We were coming back to Highway 375. But suddenly, we heard a roar, thunderous sound overhead, as if a railroad was passing over our cars. When we looked out up, there was this military helicopter that appeared and came about eight, five to eight feet above our cars on purpose, harassing us, intimidating us, and for the next 15 to 16 minutes, we were trying to get away from this, this helicopter. We were tra frantically trying to drive and go away from this area, and we were buzzed by this helicopter continuously for 15 minutes. In one occasion, this helicopter circled around as we were driving and came front of our cars at almost low level and just scared us and continued this illegal uh, maneuvering, endangering our lives.
Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Jeez. How can you see anything with it? It's, it went behind the mountain. There it is. There it is. It's flying over there. Yeah, it's flying over there. Yeah, it's moving back and forth. It's hovering over there. I had to put the gain on just to see it. Boy, am I better? Yeah, right. Right, right, right. <laughs> Fortunately, like, this isn't doing me any good. Yeah. I think so.
Let's go.
flares, aerial maneuvers or test flights of extraterrestrial spacecraft, one thing is sure. Their flight characteristics were more than unconventional. Our eyewitnesses were convinced. I saw, well, right over the horizon there, um, as most of us said so far, I saw a, a light come up and, uh, over the horizon, probably uh, a few degrees over the horizon, and it, and it broke into uh, first two lights, then three lights, and then it seemed to string, string them all together, kind of like a pearl, a string of pearls or beads, and uh, there seemed to be a connection as the light jumped from one uh, position to the next and it was kind of an orange yellow color and uh, it seemed to be sort of swirling around at the same time it wasn't a, a straight directional thing it was just it's kind of like they were going like this a little bit. what uh, was that they saw in the skies above nevada we'll try and have some answers next a big ufo convention came to an end in las vegas last night and afterwards naturally some of the members went out in the desert to search for ufos a news crew went along too and sure enough it wasn't long before a mysterious unidentified object appeared not too surprising somewhere up there you see it because this patch of desert is right near a military test site this looked like no aircraft flights that any of these folks had ever seen this was a bona fide ufo sighting I, I think it was, yeah. And then UFO means unknown flying object, and this definitely was nothing I've ever seen before. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? Was it the Aurora, the <laughs> secret plane? We don't know. More to come, I'm sure, and the Air Force is not saying anything as usual. Hmm. Oh, fascinating. You have a good weekend. Of course, all of you. Good night, everybody.